Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to our Friday morning, which has become this really, really great thing that we do. I see now we have 16 participants. It all started with just a few people um, saying, hey, let's share ideas. You know, we're going through a lot of the same business challenges, struggles, and, and victories, so let's share them. So that's really how this Friday morning started. So we're just kind of keeping it on the calendar. Um, so we advertise it on the, the um, do I need to mute? Is that what somebody's going to tell me? No, um, we keep it on, uh, we put it on the gems page and the Emerald Rockstars page. And then I think it, it started out as a senior Ruby thing, but now I kind of think we've got our senior Rubies are becoming emeralds fast and furiously, which is super cool to see everybody moving up in the ranks. And so now it's a, a gems jewels shared brainstorm. Um, so like I said, we just keep it very real, very organic. It's an idea share, you know, what's working in your business, what's maybe not, what are some challenges, what are some struggles? And that's what we're all here for. And um, I think it's been, I know for me, a huge blessing. I've gotten so much support, encouragement, and cool ideas that I've been able to implement on my team. So I'm grateful to all of you sidelines for participating. Um, so this morning, I'm super excited because Kendra, Randolph, who is a dear friend, who just kind of, she's been a great mentor to me, um, and she's done calls for me before, and, and we've had personal calls, and she's just, she's a diamond ambassador. I'll let her tell a little bit about herself, but, um, so she's just got a cool story, and a really great philosophy, and a great ser humble servant attitude, and the way she serves her team, so I think she's super inspiring, um, and so, Kendra, just let you kind of share a little bit this morning. Yay! Oh my gosh! Like I feel like I have arrived. Like I have been invited to talk to you guys. Like I'm so excited. Um, it, it's still kind of mind blowing. Um, to for someone to still call me a diamond because I really like my whole part is that I never want to feel like I'm untouchable. Um, and I always want to feel like I am just like anybody else. Cause guys, I still feel like I'm like a silver ambassador and someone just like handed me this big, huge, it's like the people who win the lottery and they have no idea what they're supposed to do with all this money. Like that's kind of how I feel <laughs> some days, <laughs> you know, I feel like I've like won this like million dollar house and then I move in and I'm like, uh, I have Goodwill furniture and I'm not quite certain what to do with it all. Um, that's kind of how I feel. So I want you guys to feel very um, comfortable with me. Um, ask me anything. I, I likely will learn a lot from you guys because I really still feel like um, we are all doing this together. Um, and so I th thank you, Dawn, for inviting me to do this. Um, just a little about myself, because I looked at the list. I don't think I know most everybody, which makes me even more um, excited. I grew my team in South Carolina. Um, I actually live in North Carolina. I started my business as a single mom. Um, I worked for a very large organ transplant team, um, and I stayed at home and worked. Um, but it was really, really, really long hours. It was a really challenging career. I kind of describe it to people as I was almost like the air traffic controller um, of organ donation for Duke University. So it was a very, very um, stressful calling. I loved it. Um, but really had been praying for a very, very long time that God would um, really give me another opportunity to help people because I absolutely loved organ donation and what I, uh, what I got to do with that. Um, but the hours were horrible. Um, I did, I, there was really no room for growth. I don't know if anybody's ever been in a position like that where it's like, I, there's nowhere, I can't go anywhere. This is as good as it's going to get. Um, but I still wanted to help people. Uh, so when I joined Plexus uh, in November of 2014, um, I really just kind of started the products to just um, lose some extra weight and get healthy. Um, but then when I really started researching the products, I understood the comp plan. I didn't actually realize how red I was. I didn't even know what red meant. Um, but I'm very entrepreneur minded. Um, I, when I see an opportunity, I run with it. Um, it's kind of the same way with my husband. Um, I saw an opportunity and I ran with that. And I got married. <laughs> I got married while I was on this journey. Um, I was a uh, root senior gold when I met my husband. Um, and we got married right after I turned emerald. 
So, um, and I, I think getting married is almost a business decision also. <laughs> so I've been very, very blessed with um, adding, so I became Emerald and then I added two more children to my family. Um, so me and my son and his two children um, move, I moved here to North Carolina. So about 45 minutes away from my team, which was probably one of the biggest challenges that I faced in my business was moving away from my core team. Um, my husband's uh, wife passed away um, about a year when we got married. So that's been a challenge. These are more my, just my transparency, personal story, just to let people know, like, you know, you don't really know what is going on behind the scenes in people's life. Um, it was a huge challenge to come in. Um, John Michael, the baby was uh, six months old when I met him. Um, he was three weeks old when his mom passed away. Um, and then his daughter was five. Um, and so when we got married, I, was just emerald um i ended up with two six-year-olds and a six-month-old so it was um it was a lot uh on me and my family and just and then learning how he didn't really understand network marketing i mean he i was making emerald money so he was pretty bought in to the idea of me working this business but he really didn't have any idea what this looked like. Um, so we definitely had some challenges when we first got married. Um, I actually was halfway to Sapphire just on sheer momentum and then actually went backwards and points almost down to Emerald when we got married. And I'm not at all blaming that on my husband, but it just was a huge life change and a huge transition to get our family jailed to be able to actually, you know, kind of continue that momentum. So that's just a little transparent part about me that um, I think sometimes can make people feel better, you know, to know that it's not always this straight up, you know, shot to, to diamond. There, there are definitely life circumstances. There are things that happen. There are back offices. You know, there are people who go and they go to another company or maybe you've got a rock star on your team that just decided uh, this isn't for me. I'm, I'm going to do what I'm doing right now, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to work my business anymore. So there are lots of things I think that can happen to people. Um, so that's why I share that part for you guys, because I can almost guarantee you somebody on here has probably had a life circumstance. that's kind of maybe tripped them up a little. Um, okay. How old are my children now? Let's see. John Michael is two. Um, and Riken and Molly are seven. So I have two, uh, first graders and a two year old. So it is, um, it is interesting. Uh, you were talking, Dawn, about um, how to um, get your kids to do things. Um, if you have that Zoom call, will you please invite me to it? <laughs> because, oh, the struggle is real. Uh, it is, yeah, it is, it is crazy. So that's a, that's a little bit about me, Dawn. So y'all tell me what you want to talk about and we'll, we'll open it up. Okay. I think, um, and I wrote down, I think one thing we I have a we talk a little bit about spousal support a lot. I know for I, I I think at some level maybe everybody maybe struggles if it's not spousal support maybe it's like a parent or whoever someone that's really close in your your close network um, when they don't really understand it and they don't really buy in and you're running up against that wall like what are some things any and I mean I open with this call we kind of open up to anybody so. I would love to hear from anybody because I've got a couple notes I made, but that would be like maybe something we could talk about. <laughs> what do you do? I, I would, yeah, <laughs> I'll tell you just transparently. I know we're recorded, so you cannot share this with um, my husband. Um, so one of the struggles for me was um, his late wife was very much the, the uh, typical stay-at-home mommy. Like she really had no desire to, to work. Um, I mean, well, she worked in the home. Um, and so when we got married, one of the kind of, I guess his normal life was that, you know, cook, clean, take care of the kids. And he kind of went and did his work and then he came home and she had everything ready. Um, and that's not how our house rolls like now. <laughs> so, um, it was definitely a sit down conversation and it was a very 
rough conversation of like, listen, there's no, I am not a stay at home mom. I am a work from home mom. Like my job is here in the house. <laughs> um, and so I think sometimes for us, I don't know how many of you guys are stay at home moms. I would assume a good bit of you because it's 10 o'clock in the morning and you guys are on a call. Um, so you're probably home. And I think sometimes our spouses, um, take, and I'm choosing my words wisely, they only not really take advantage of that whole stay at home mommy role that we like to promote, right? I mean, we like to promote that to people of like, hey, we can help you stay at home. But what I think people fail to realize and the words that I have changed is I am a work from home mom. I am not a stay at home mom. Um, and so I think when you give that perception to people and your spouse, um, and your family that a lot of times people just assume you have this like unlimited amount of time to just be wherever they need you to be. So it was some boundaries for me. I really sat Michael down and was like, listen, like if you want, you know, to retire, right, you always go to their why. And that was a really big key factor for me, guys, was actually making my husband, um, my why and, and speaking that out loud, like he wants to retire so he can stay home. Um, and so I say that out loud and I think sometimes that's very affirming to him because you know, men kind of like you to do that often and <laughs> talk about them. So a lot of times if I feel like he's maybe not engaging quite as much, maybe he's not doing the dishes or changing the diaper, you know, I will always say to my team, I so look forward to being, you know, a diamond emerald team where we can retire, you know, Michael and he is my why and he is why I work so hard. So sometimes I think if you can affirm them that you are working that hard, this hard for them, um, I don't know, just, it seems to speak their love language for me. Um, I don't know about your family, but so a lot of times when I am going to work, I'm going to do something, I'm having to sacrifice um, my children's, you know, maybe something with my children or my husband, I always remind them of their why and what maybe they want to do and why mommy is having to do this. So Dawn, I don't know if that helps or not, but I, um, I think it's just the perception that you give people. And if you give your, you know, if you, if you don't specifically explain to your spouse, like what is involved in like how much time, especially if you're trying to rank up to a promotion, like now that I'm at diamond, I, I really have kind of stepped back a little bit. Um, I mean, I still work my business very strategically, but I am able, like right now, I, I specifically on my calendar, I only work two weekends out of the month. Now that doesn't mean I'm not answering messages and stuff, but I specifically give that time back that we sacrificed when I was building the diamond and I'm giving it back to my family now. So like if someone messages me and says, Hey, I've got a meeting I want to do on this date. I will specifically look at my calendar and say, I'm sorry, that's my family's weekend. But I didn't do that when I was growing. I mean, I pretty much would go anywhere people needed me to within reason. Um, but I was doing a lot of sacrificing. So I feel like as you grow, it does get better, but your family needs to understand what the outcome is going to be when you get to that, whatever pinnacle that is that you're, you're looking to reach. Yeah, that's really good. And I, cause I know that, um, me personally too have, I was a stay at home mom. And so I hadn't worked in a decade. And so there, my family went from like, having mom home and full all in and the cooking and the cleaning and the everything in order to this kind of slow, you know, she's kind of doing this thing and then it kind of grows. And, and I think the, I know for me personally, that was a really hard adjustment for my husband, especially like not really. And it wasn't like I went out and put a resume and said, I'm going to get a job. You know, I'm going to go start working 40 hours a week or 20 or whatever. And so it's sort of that. And one thing if I, we're little, it's, we've kind of gotten over the hump, I have to say, but when I was really starting to build, like after starting last spring, trying to get to that emerald where really was pushing hard, one thing if I looked back that I, I missed was building his belief. I talk so much about building my own team's belief and looking at those four quadrants, belief in yourself, belief in the company, belief in network marketing. I missed that I needed to build my husband's belief in network marketing, in the company, in the products, and then in my own vision. 
Um, and so if I if could offer anything now, we the belief kind of happened when he actually started to really see it. But I could have done a better job on the front end working through him. So I don't know. I'll just throw that out there. Can but I say it, something to that as well? Yeah. Um, my husband has been Mr. Skeptical the whole time. And he would get frustrated at me working, you know, because I too was a stay-at-home mom and I had too. <laughs> it's hard. I am a work-from-home mom as well. So, but anyway, the best thing that I did, um, because he wouldn't receive it from me, like building the belief, like he just, he wouldn't receive that necessarily from me. But um, my first leaders retreat, I took my mom because I thought, how fun, you know, he'll stay home with the kids. And he's never gone to an event with me until we went to Washington, D.C. That is the thing that it, everything changed after that. Well, two things, actually. We sat down together. Like I tried, you know, personal development's awesome because I learned to, his strengths are organizing and mine are not. And he's the clean one. I am not. I'm the mess maker. So I sat down with him and I was like, I need you. You have to help me make a schedule. And, and I scheduled time off so, and we honored that. So that was really good. But it was really going to an event, leaders retreat. We came home and he was like, this is no longer your thing. This is our thing. And then like two weeks ago, he sat here and he literally cried on the couch and said, I've been praying for a family economy. I never thought this would be it because we're actually planning on him being home with us full time starting um, before the summer. So now he's all in and everything's changed really since bringing him to a, a corporate event. Amy, yes, I want to piggyback on that. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me and not my crazy loud yes, kids? I hear okay. you. Um, no, that's the same with us. Like, uh, first convention, I went by myself and I was like, Oh, my husband can stay home with the kid, you know, with the Eli. And then he went to convention last year and he actually went to the meetings and I didn't think he was going to. And then, um, he wanted to go to leaders retreat and now he's like, we're scrambling for childcare for this convention, but we're like committed that he's going to convention because he has that vision now. And I would say for us, it's also like I had I used, we used to sit on the couch and watch TV together every night. Like that was our thing, you know, and obviously I'm not doing that anymore, but instead of doing that, like we sat down with our calendar and we're like, okay, when can we get date nights in this month? Um, so even though I'm like sacrificing those nights on the couch with him, he's okay with it because he sees the vision now. Um, and now he knows he's going to get like one-on-one -on -one quality date night time together. Um, so that's something we've done. Like instead of, feeling like we're not getting any time together. We're making time ahead of time on the calendar to get out of the house together. So that's been good for us. Just another quick um, suggestion that I feel like I should, I don't know, I feel very convicted to, to, to give you guys permission for this. Um, and I, I can't remember where I read it. I think it was in, uh, let me find the book. Um, I'll have to find it. I'll show it to you in a minute. But, um, it was talking about the $5 an hour task and the $100 an hour task. Has anybody ever heard this before? Okay, so a lot of times when you are building and you are, you're looking at your list of things to do, your $100 an hour tasks are the things that are going to build your business, right? So like, let's say you've got a whole laundry list of things. You've got your house stuff. You've got your, your business stuff. You've got your, your growth. You, you've got to go out and actually like recruit people. So you've got all these things that are just running through y'all's your heads right now. Well, there are certain things in your life that are $5 an hour tasks. Let me give you some scrubbing the toilet, um, laundry, uh, dishes, um, th those kind of like $5 an hour task. Okay. A hundred dollar an hour task would be hosting a sip and see because you could potentially get four people to sign up with a building business bonus. Right. So you, does that make sense? It's like, what are the things that are $5 an hour tasks versus a hundred dollar an hour task? Well, when I first got married, one of the things that I was trying to do, um, was I was trying to keep up with my husband's late wife and I was trying to be her or I was trying to be this this Betty Crocker and I'm so not Betty Crocker mother um, to my family. And what was happening is my business was going backwards because I was trying to do all these $5 an hour tasks that somebody else could help me with. I was trying to be a martyr. Like I was trying to be the hero. I was trying to be the person that was getting it all together and I was failing miserably. So one of the things that I did was I actually hired someone to come and clean my house. I know, <gasps> gasp. Um, it was the best thing I ever did. They only 
we live in the middle of like nowhere. So they could only come like once every two weeks, but it was one of the best things that I did is I gave myself permission for my house to not be always together. <laughs> Um, and I hired someone and if you if you did the math on what it costs to hire someone to come in every two weeks to like do the deep cleaning now I still ha I have three kids I have to keep my house clean but that's the other thing is I explained to my husband that's a five dollar an hour task for me like if you guys can every night before you go to bed you guys can get the house clean and I can go and work during these critical hours because I don't know for you guys like the critical time for me when everybody's like at home working is like right around bedtime it's it's like 8.30 to like 10.30 people are actually sitting at their computer then you can actually correspond with people so my husband just made the commitment that he would help me every night you know get the house clean for most husbands they really just need a very specific they're not multitaskers you just need to tell them I need your help to do this um, the other thing that I did when I built to diamond was I actually paid my mom to come and do my laundry um, that was the best spent money I ever spent was for her. And I, I don't anymore. Like once I got to diamond and once I kind of got set, settled in, I've taken back over my home. Um, <laughs> and it's great. Um, and I, but I do still have someone come clean my house every two weeks. Um, and when I move closer to civilization, they're probably coming once a week. <laughs> so I, I feel like for a lot of women, we almost feel like a failure because we need some or we want someone to come in and, and help clean our house. So I don't know. I feel very convicted to like share with you guys that like I got over that really quickly when I was like, you know what? My dream is bigger than my, than my perception of what I'm giving to people. Um, you know, sometimes we put ourselves as women on this pedestal of like, we have to have it all together all the time and we can't ask for help. Sometimes you just need to ask for help. Um, and think about those things that are $5 an hour versus $100 an hour. And if you're doing way more $5 an hour task versus $100 an hour task, you probably need to ask for help. Um, so senior Ruby status is when I normally recommend people like, uh, you, you may want to get a house cleaner <laughs> to come and help you. Cause I get it guys. Like, I mean, you still have, to, I mean, you, you still have to keep your house clean, but like, I want to make certain that like, I don't have germs all over my house. You know, like there's certain things that you've got to, you've got to take care of. So I don't know. I just felt very led to, to give you guys permission to like ask for help. Um, I think that's where a lot of people get stuck is yeah. they try to do way too much on their own. I hear you. I like Amber. Amber asked if we have to feed our, I know they, they have to be fed. Those little, okay. Monsters. Yeah. There's certain, okay. <laughs> now see, then there's certain things that are illegal <laughs> and there's certain things that are, um, uh, illegal and, and <laughs> Okay. Yes. You have to still feed your children. You still have to take them to school. Um, I hope that makes sense to everybody. Oh, like $5 an hour. I wish I could remember. I think it was, um, it's so true. It's all part of it, having a good business strategy. I think, you know, yes. I mean that what, like where we are in our business is we're aspiring to that diamond. I mean, if we've gotten this far, we're going all the way. So that's all part of the strategy. Like, okay, who, and we, you know, we're always evolving and changing. And so we have to keep, we kind of analyzing, where we are in our journey. So absolutely. I believe it's this book. Hang on. Anybody else have anything? Let's see. We have no kids and we have a cleaner. I think it's this book. book. FYI. What's it called? What's it called? Success is not an accident by Tom Success. Bradbury. I think that's yeah. where I got that from. I, it may be a different book. I'm, 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 I'm not really a reader. I'm an audio person. I listen to a lot of books on audio. And then if I love the book, I actually buy the book. Um, it somehow makes me feel better to like have it sitting on my bookshelf and I can say, I, I listened to it. <laughs> it's like, sitting there. I'm like, I really didn't read that book. I listened to it. I did actually read this whole book. This is a great book, by the way. Okay. Um, that's good. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> you guys, anybody else have anything to that, that topic? Anything to offer? Well, I know um, for myself that my husband and I have also struggled. So two of the things that we recently have done for ourselves, um, huge thing, like Amy said, is that he's finally attending the events. Like he actually, his first event was also DC and he 
just meeting the people and seeing the integrity of the company, he was like, wow, this is the real deal. So ever since that event, he plans on attending all of my Plexus events with me. Like he ended up coming to Super Saturday with me. Um, he just recently requested time off for convention. And that's him doing it all on his own now, like without me having to ask. So that was huge. And then in addition to kind of like what um, Amber was saying, because it was, my husband is a very manly looking man, but also super sensitive. Um, he's kind of like the girl in the relationship. But we've recently just added date night on the date that we got married. So we got married on the 24th. And so every single month, we, regardless of what it is, what day it falls on, that's our date night. So every single month on the 24th, to give him that time, we, you know, have committed to doing that. And another thing that's helped us a great deal um, is counseling. So we go to therapy, we go to counseling to kind of help, and we've learned a lot, like the love languages. Um, communication has been really big in our uh, marriage, and I'm sure everyone can probably agree to that. So I just feel that whatever you need to do, because he wasn't comfortable with going to the counseling session, but now it's gotten to the point where once we got past that, he now loves going and enjoys going. It's like a growing opportunity for the two of us that really allows us to speak our minds with that middle person, not let mm -hmm. things get ugly. So those are just a couple of things that I've learned along the way in the two years that I've been in my journey that, you know, I don't know what everyone's struggles are, but I'm sure we're all, we all experience the same struggles. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, um, Dawn, someone had a question for me. Um, okay. Kendra, what did you do to turn your business around after you started moving backwards in points? Okay. That was my next topic, you guys. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> I, yeah, I was like, we want to talk about that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, um, gosh, there's, um, I never, ever, ever stopped working my business. Okay, so I want to, I want to start with that. I, I never stopped um, doing the bottom line basic stuff. Okay. So a lot of times I know when people kind of have a life circumstance, they, they may have to go off the grid for a little while. So I just want to like clarify, I was still doing, you know, two opportunity meetings and trainings a month. I was still doing zoom calls. I was, well, at that point, I don't think we had zoom, but we, whatever it was, I still maintained the bottom line of my business. So I will recommend like whenever a life circumstance happens, always have a DMO for your business. Like not, not the DMO that we talk about, like building your business, but just that like core thing that you've got to do. So posting on your team page or doing a call, whatever it was that you did to get to that point, like don't stop doing it because your team, everyone desires boundaries and consistency. The two big words that I can always, for leadership, I can always train on is consistency and boundaries. So don't change anything. Um, okay, so but to answer your question about what I feel like I did when I grew from Emerald, back from Emerald to Diamond was leadership. Um, I am a natural leader. Like it's not something I have to think about it's just a god given gift um and but i didn't know how to use my gift okay i used the example of like my husband gave me an iphone um, or a, um, an iWatch watch for christmas okay um it really pretty much sits right here um it's a great tool a great gift but i don't really know how to use it to its full effectiveness Okay. So a lot of times it just sits on my desk. I mean, I know how to use the basics. Like I know, but I mean, this thing could probably run my life. It could probably clean my house for me if I knew how to use it correctly. It's crazy, amazing, but I don't know how to use the gift. Okay. Is that making sense to everyone? I have the gift, but I don't know how to use it because I haven't sat down and actually learned how to use it. So I have a natural gift of leadership. Likely if you were on this call, you have a natural gift of leadership too. I did not know how to use my iWatch. I did not know how to use my leadership gift. 
So I started studying leadership. Um, this book right here, the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership is like my Bible, I'm not joking. It is literally tabbed with every chapter. So when someone comes to me and asks, and I taught on it, I did two book studies. Um, I think there were seven weeks, I think there's 21 laws, three chapters, seven weeks. Um, and the first group was really just, hey guys, I need some people to, to study this book with me. So it was more of like a, we all took a chapter and kind of learned it together. And then I taught on it. Um, and we basically just went on a leadership journey and we all like learned how to steward our gift. Um, and so what I do with this book a lot of times is like if someone comes to me and they're like, I just cannot get anybody to show up on my team call or I just can't get anybody to show up to my opportunity meetings. Well, then that's likely the law of buy-in. You haven't got people to buy into your vision. So I will just send them to chapter 14. I will a lot of times read it over and then we'll have them read it because you're always getting them to do something in return. I don't usually teach anybody to do anything. I have them teach me. So what I'll do is I will say, hey, listen, you know, go get your 21 laws of leadership. Go read chapter 14. Message me back after you read it and let's talk about it. I'm going to go read it too. And then we're going to talk about it and see what your next step is. Does that make sense to everybody? So it's like they give you something back. You give them something back. Um, so I would say for me, it was learning how to lead a team and bring up other leaders. You can't do it on your own. And that's what I was doing. I was pretty much my leadership gift was being taken advantage of almost. Um, it's like everybody just kept running to me, running to me, running to me. Guys, I can't tell you probably one of the most rewarding things in my journey has been that I can normally go to bed at night with not a single message that comes over on my phone. And what I know, unless it's a new ambassador that I've just signed up, you know, they're, they're still in the nest, you know, we're still having to work on them. But my leaders are all leaders now. And they don't really, now I'm not saying that they don't ask me questions, but it's normally because it's just our time to talk. Um, and that is one, that's what you're looking for. You are looking for people to not need you anymore. So I started kicking people out of the nest and I was like, you're a leader and I, there's no way I can grow anymore if I'm doing everything for everyone. So the law of empowerment, empowering people to actually take ownership of their team and not being so readily available. <laughs> um, the, another great book for you guys um, is Leaders um, Ask Great Questions. I don't think that's the exact title of it. I'll have to find it. I'm obviously a John Mack. Oh, that's the other thing I did. I was so into leadership that I actually went and become a certified um, John Maxwell coach, trainer, speaker. I don't actually use that. It's not like a, I don't really do anything with it. I just invested in myself and I learned how to use the watch. <laughs> I was like, I have this amazing gift that could probably make me thousands and thousands of dollars more than I'm making now to, you know, retire my husband and, you know, do live this dream. But I was stuck. I was completely, that's it. Good leaders ask great questions. So a lot of times people you're likely enabling your team. You're likely giving everyone the answer. You need to learn how to ask questions. You need to learn how to get them to actually find the answer for themselves. Um, and so that's, that's the two books that normally are really good for people because most of my leaders and they're still doing it. They're still enabling their leaders, but I'm not enabling mine. So they've got to go learn it on their own. So every time they come to me, I'm like, are you enabling your team or are you empowering your team? Um, that's huge. So don't enable, you want to empower. Did that answer who, I can't remember who, well, it was Melissa that asked me that question. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. That's perfect. Okay, good. Thank you okay, much. good. You're well, you're welcome. Um, Kendra, I have a question for you. Um, uh, we we are experiencing the same issue as far as evolving leaders and empowering our leaders. Uh, yeah. We we are guilty of enabling, and I, when I say we, I say my best friend, my sideline, Gwen. Um, 
we are we are really starting to put more off onto them and it's hard to do and we're we're comparing it to when we're raising our children enabling our children and we're like we we're learning from personal life and business life too um but I, you just hit that nail on the head for me. I appreciate that so much because I'm, I have read the Laws of Leadership book. I'm going to go back and mark it like you did. <laughs> and I'm going to grow from that because we have several people, several gold. And Gwen is senior Ruby with me. Um, we have several golds, a ton of silvers, and we're trying to grow them. Um, but we're also putting a lot more off. And I had one that wanted me to meet her for coffee. And I said, well, what about your upline? You know, I'm happy to help you and meet you, but you know, let's, let's get you involved with your upline and trying to put more back off on them. So I appreciate that so much. You're welcome. And one of the other things that I did, as you were talking, that reminded me is in the book, um, in, in the, in the book, he talks about the 80, 20 rule. That was something else that I, I was doing wrong. I was spending the majority of my time with my bottom 80%, the people that I was just dragging along and like begging and pleading and getting in. And, and so what I did back when I started to fall in points and after I started reading this book and really understanding leadership and the Pareto theory, I really started investing 80% of my time in my top 20%, the people who really wanted it. Um, and when I flipped and I started working and, and my upline Haley uses this term, um, I'll match your efforts. So if they, what they do is what I do. Um, and I am, I am very yellow. I am naturally red, but I have a lot of yellow in me. Um, and so anytime someone Brady like yourself that comes and says you're an enabler, I am a recovering enabler. <laughs> um, like I was married to an alcoholic. Um, I was sicker than he was like a lot of my personal growth and development story is my ex-husband and all the things that I went through when, um, I mean, I literally went bankrupt because of my enabling. Um, and so I had to study enablement. So I tend, that is a habit for me. Um, I tend to think I I'm a, always the caregiver and I always have to do for everybody. That's why I went into the healthcare field. It's why I love people. It's why I love personal growth and development. But when you're running this like a business, it's the same thing with your marriage. Just like I said at the beginning, my marriage to me, I mean, it's so much more, but it was a business agreement. Like we're going into a partnership together. Like it's 50, 50, you know, we're going, we are, we are teaming up and going into a partnership together. It's not an enablement relationship. I can't enable him. He can't enable me. We empower each other. So I have to, I think about that in my business as well. Like I may have friends who I go and enable, but when I'm working my business, I can't enable people because it's going to make me stall. So, um, when I started to not think about this as a ministry and a business, my business took off. Um, and it's crazy how it works. Um, so I would really empower you, Brandy, um, to go the law of empowerment. Uh, the other thing I was going to say about that book, um, you don't necessarily have to read it from beginning to end. I think you need to one time, but I really, it's the same thing as the Bible. I've never read the Bible from beginning to end. I have no desire to, I would get so confused around Leviticus that like, I would like have to I, like I get so confused. You can utilize a book like John Maxwell's book, like this one as a standalone chapter and you can go read that chapter over and over and over again. And that's, that's what I think people, they don't use this as a tool. They use it as like a book from, uh, okay, I read that book. That's what they'll say to me. I'm like, okay, but are you working the book? Like, are you are you applying the book? I don't want you just to read it. I want you to study it. I want you to teach it. I want you to live it out. I want you to actually be burdened by those chapters that you're stuck on. And like I've got several people. One of my um, stronger chapters is the law of navigation. I am actually naturally prophetic. Um, it, it's just, it's one of those gifts. So I can usually talk to someone and kind of coach them through like, okay, what's their next step. But I've got several of my team members who the law of navigation is probably at the very bottom. So 
I use my strength to help them navigate. But if they don't know that that's a weakness of theirs, it's very hard for me as a leader to know how to help them. So when your leaders start reading this book, you as the leader need to kind of know, okay, where is their strength and where is their weakness um, so that you can kind of help them along the journey. So hopefully that helps, Brandy. It does help. And I, real quickly, when you said you, you know, you're traveling and you're, you stopped cutting a lot of that out once you became diamond, it's opportunity meetings. I mean, when we did our first opportunity meeting, we didn't have my upline Aaron with us. We just did it. But so many of our team are asking us to be there. And some of these are five hours, six hours away. And some of them would be overnight. Did you travel like that? And where did okay. you learn to draw the line? Okay. So remember my two keywords are consistency and boundaries. <laughs> so um, my boundary was you had to be uh, gold or halfway to gold. If it was going to be more than two hours away, you need to be halfway to senior, like halfway to senior gold. Um, and you had to have had at least two or three opportunity meetings before I would come. Oh, that's good to know. And so okay. when I would tell them if you will get to, and now it's around Ruby. Um, if I'm going to travel to your city, you, you need to earn Ruby. And what happens is people like they work really hard to get to Ruby or they work really hard to get to gold. So yeah, I don't travel. Um, I, I travel eh, probably twice a month. I try to go to different places, but because of zoom, um, it has really helped tremendously. I do a lot of small groups rather than like I have one big team meeting that I do once a week just to kind of pour into to the whole team. But I do a lot of small groups. So like when they're kind of creating their culture in their area, then I will offer like once a month to get on like their team call. Um, and they don't always take me up on it. But like the thing is when you're setting a boundary and for most of you that are enablers, that's going to make you really uncomfortable. The other best book, if I have enablers, on here um, my other can you tell that I like to re okay hang on this is my other great book to recommend if anybody has struggles with telling people no um, is the book boundaries um, highly 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 recommend this for anybody on your team that struggles with um, enablement this this book changed my life this book right here probably is why I'm a diamond um, if I had not studied and read this book after my divorce um, and learned really what my issues were, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. But for someone who's an enabler, we struggle with telling people no. So a tip for that is you always want to give them, you want to offer them something else. So instead of saying, no, I'm sorry, you've got to make it to gold and you've got to do two meetings, whatever your boundary looks like, um, you can say, but in the meantime, <laughs> I would love to do a team call for your team. And we can do a Zoom call. You can get your people together, get them to give questions. Because for me, I don't like to just tell someone no, you know, because I, I want them to feel like I can still offer them something. So when you're giving someone a boundary um, that they've got to meet, and really I wouldn't call it a boundary with them. It's a goal, you know. Hey, um, Dawn, you know, if you can get, you know, two meetings together, to, it could be sip and seats. That's the other quick thing I want to mention. Um, in my experience, sip and sees are a whole lot more effective for most people. I do opportunity meetings mostly for ambassadors. Um, it's really hard to get guests to come to an opportunity meeting. Um, I think it's because of uh, other network marketing companies. I won't say any names, but other network marketing companies, I think have kind of um, jaded people into coming to like a hotel or a restaurant. But if you can get people to come to someone's living room, I, it's just an easier process. It's almost like a small group kind of, you know, just people are a lot more comfortable with that. So I tend to do opportunity meetings honestly for my ambassadors um because they like the networking of the opportunity meeting um so i would encourage your teams to do sip and sees over opportunity meetings but like nikki if if you're gonna go um to someone 
then you would want to do an opportunity meeting and not a sip and see. You wouldn't want to be in someone's living room. You would want to be somewhere else to, to draw more people in. Um, and I, I started as with opportunity meetings and I always laugh and joke about, I was like, really, they were sip and sees. I just don't like to have people in my house. <laughs> so I found a restaurant and your teams tend to monkey see monkey do. So all of my team just assumed they needed to go find a restaurant or, uh, you know, a library to have an opportunity meeting. And I kind of, they duplicated the wrong way. And so I had, I've been having to kind of reteach them. No, the reason I had it in a, a, a hotel or in a coffee shop or wherever I had it was because I don't like to have people come to my house. <laughs> so if you have people that don't mind people coming over to their house, I, I really have found that the sip and sees work a lot more effectively. Did you do more, do more of those? I mean, I know your diamonds, you've got a ton of people under you now. But when you think back when you were senior Ruby to become Emerald, did you, did you do all of that for your team as well? I mean, or did you do I more? Did, I know I did two, um, I did two opportunity meetings a month minimum. Um, and then if, if someone wanted me to come and do a smaller meeting, then I would go do a smaller meeting. But yeah, um, I've never not until recently until like about, I guess, December was the first time in two years that I had never done two sip and sees or opportunity meetings. Um, so, and I, I at least try to do at least one a month now. Um, I've kind of, this month I'm not doing one, but it's mostly because I'm really focusing people on the sip and sees because what happens is if I'm in town, a lot of times people aren't doing sip and sees. They're like, well, I'll just go to the one Kinder's doing. And so I'm trying to pull back a little. That's that navigation that you, yes. you kind of have to figure <laughs> out. Um, so once I kind of get people realizing these sip and sees work, because what was happening is I was showing up to opportunity meetings and 95% of the people in the room were ambassadors. I mean, I could fill a room with 40 and 50 ambassadors and one guest. I'm like, okay, this isn't working for duplication. We've got to switch it up. So that's the other thing to give yourself permission is, um, you know, don't stop your standard of practice. We talked about that earlier, like know kind of what it is that you're doing, but pay attention to as you grow, things may have to change just a little bit. Um, so I'm trying to lead my team to do more of their own meetings. So I've kind of pulled back and it stresses me out. <laughs> like it's, it's, I'm like, Oh my God, I hope they do. Okay. Um, the other thing about opportunity meetings is make certain that if they're going to host an opportunity meeting and it is an open invitation, that they know how to host an opportunity meeting as an open invitation. What I have found is that just because people show up to 10 opportunity meetings does not mean they can lead a meeting and it does not mean they can close a meeting. And if I'm going to be inviting people to come to an opportunity meeting, I want to know that it's going to be well round, well ran. You've got one shot. You know, so if you're in a, if you're in a sip and see environment, that's a little more forgiving, but if you're going to stand up in front of 15, 20, 25 people, you better know your PowerPoint. If you're going to have one, you better know that the technology is going to work. You better know what you're going to talk about and you better know how to close a meeting. Um, and I've gone to several where I've now been like hosted. Um, and it was a train wreck. I mean, I'm gonna be honest. I mean, I was like, this is not, and I had guests there, you know, and I was like, this is so just make certain like as a leader that, um, if it's their downline and they mess it up, then that's their own business. But if they're going to open it up, cause we're, I love the one plexus environment. I think that that is why our company is so strong, but it can sometimes be a double edged sword. You know, because people can, can, they want to duplicate because they hear us say, you need to have opportunities, you have sip and sees, and well, then they start doing it and they're not effective. Um, and so I try to coach people on that and be like, not to scare them, but guys, ho hosting opportunity meeting is one of the hardest things that I do. Um, I mean, honestly, um, and, and people don't, they don't understand how to network with people. I mean, they, it just, anyways, I'll get off my soapbox about opportunity means, but I have gone to a couple because I've stepped back and now been like, you know, hey, invite me to come, right? Like, I'll come and I'll be the guest speaker. Yeah, we're not doing that no more. <laughs> and I'm not a control freak at all. Like, I'm an empowering leader, but I've gone and I'm like, 
uh uh-uh, like that ain't going to work. Like you're not going to put me on a graphic, you know? So now as you guys as senior leaders and your senior Ruby, if you're going to be on a graphic, people are going to show up to hear you speak, especially when you hit Emerald status and you want to make certain that your leaders, do you want to empower them? But I guess what I'm saying is make certain that you're involved, like make certain that they really understand you've got one shot. If those guests show up and it's a train wreck and they can't, they can't control the crowd. Like that's not fair to other, that's not fair to other people that are, are inviting guests to come to that open meeting. Okay. That is so not what we were talking about. So, but that is, (laughs) I've been on such a, like, I've been on such a soapbox about opportunity meetings recently. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my recent soapbox. So you kind of open it. (laughs) Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, Thank you for letting me be a part of this group. Thank you again. Um, so I have been finding that I have been invited to come to sip and sees and I love coming to sip and sees, but I kind of tried to empower one of my leaders with kind of like, okay, I know you want me there, but I want your team to want you there. Cause she's almost senior gold. So I want them to feel like Shelly's coming and Shelly's helping versus Rachel needs to be there for people to attend. And so it was hard for me to say no, but I felt like it was the right thing to do because ultimately I don't want them to rely on me to have a good sip and see opportunity meeting, totally different. Right. But they can run a sip and see. They're really, really good at it. She's like, but we just want you there. And I've been there for a couple. So I had to have that like butterfly heart palpitating, like, no, I don't think this is actually going to be the best thing for your growth. Like, you know, and she knows me, she knows that I'm learning to be a leader but was, I'm hoping that was the right thing to do. And I can still go if it's not, but I just, I felt led to be like, I really need to empower you to run your own sip and sees without me yep. and for you to be this one. Yes. Not me. That's good. So this is pretty easy. Um, yes, it is. Um, see one, do one, teach one. Okay. So they go and they see, they see you do one and then they do one and then they start teaching to do one. Okay. So, cause remember you are always working yourself out of the job always. Okay. So you're always working yourself out of doing sip and sees. You are always working yourself out of doing opportunity meetings. You're always working yourself out of doing zoom calls. Now, what that means is as you are working yourself out of doing things, you're going to be elevated. You're going to be doing the next thing because the people underneath you are going to actually be doing the sip and sees and the opportunity meetings and the trainings. Okay. You don't want your team to need you. I know that that is like really hard to hear, but like the, uh, and it was actually Celeste Gwen. I did an interview. I'm hopeful I can get it to download and I can share it with you guys. But, um, that was one of the things that I, the question that I asked Celeste is, um, what is the one mistake that leaders make? And, and she said, and I'm not going to try to speak her words, but like what I got from it was that, um, leaders who come to her and are like, my, my team member did not invite me to their sip and see, or my, um, downline did not invite me to get on, to be hosted on their team call. She's like, that's crazy. (laughs) She's like, you want your team to not need you. Like that's the whole point of leadership is that you are working yourself into freedom. I want to have so many diamonds on my team that nobody knows my name. Like that's my goal is that people do not know my name. Now, I mean, of course I want them. Remember, I don't want to be untouchable. I want people to feel like they have a connection to me, but if you're looking for freedom, you do, you're right. You do not want to have to show up to every flip and sip and see you want, you don't, that's not freedom. Like what, that's why I got convicted over my calendar. I was like, no, I mean, I'm a diamond now. Why am I saying yes to every single thing that comes across my desk? Like that's not freedom. Who wants that job? You know, like my team members are looking at me going, oh my gosh, if that's what I have to do every month, then I don't know that I want to be a diamond. So be careful with like what you're, um, giving people because a lot of times people will get kind of scared off about what is expected of them. So what you can do is what I have is I call it a wish list. So 
when someone, I, I will, I will make my calendar and I will make my commitments for the dates that I am available to do things. And I'm pretty strategic about that. Like, okay, where, where is my growth? Like, where do I need to go? This may look different for you guys at Senior Ruby, but as you grow, you kind of know, like, I need to go work with that, with that. So what I do is when someone comes to me and they, I know that I, they've seen me do a meeting. I've seen them do a meeting and it's all good, right? You've kind of approved it. It's, it's, you're good. They know what they're doing. Then I will say, Hey, I have a wish list and I'm going to put that down on my wish list. Um, and I'm going to commit to a couple of things. It'll depend on the date and I, but I've got to fit my family in. Let me figure out what my family's agenda looks like. And if I can fit it in, I would love to come, but Hey, let it be a surprise. If I come like your team's going to come and you're, you're, yeah, the people are going to come because you're there because I, because you're an amazing leader and I want them to come because it's yours. And then if I'm able to come, I will let you know that day or maybe like the day before. Um, but let's just let it be a surprise if I show up. That's what I've been doing. Um, and then, and for me and my husband, I have a wish list of things and then we kind of go through. And if I'm, you know, if my family life is going good and you know, the kids are, doing well, I will look at my wish list and go, Hey, you know what? I, I think I want to go to this tonight. And then I surprise them and I show up and like they, they, they love that so much more. I love to walk into an opportunity meeting or a sip and see as a, like they think it's a guest walking in and I walk in and everybody's like, Oh my God, Kendra's here, you know, and it really makes it special. So that's a, just a suggestion that you, you can start doing. No, thank you for affirming that because I was, I, you know, I'm learning and I was like, this feels like the right thing to do, expand, engage, empower. Yes. And so I yes. really appreciate you affirming that. That means a lot to me. No, a lot. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, Vicki is doing this thing with three-way calls. So as soon as someone joins, they get on a three-way call with the ambassador and the newbie. And I feel like what that's going to do in incorporating this is, you know, the 80-20, we know yeah. who to put our time into it. If they're going to be a wholesale customer and they just want the products for free or if they want to work the business. And so we can start to categorize people. So like I've been feeling very convicted about, and I just want to share this with y'all because I feel like God wants me to share it. And I want to, you know, maybe someone else has been feeling this way, but I think there's a way to get to Emerald where you just do points. And then I think there's a way to get to Emerald where you actually have a solid team. Because realistically, we can sign up a bunch of wholesale customers. We can get everyone to turn their backup order back on. And I, I feel like God has been telling me pause and really get back into pouring into my team and making sure we have a solid foundation because everyone's close to ranking and they're really excited, but we've had massive attrition. And so it's just been one of those things where I know how to hustle and get the points. I know how to even add 10 level ones myself, but what's that going to do? You get Alexis, a trip to Hawaii and you know, do you keep the points? Where's your team at? So, um, I didn't know if you had any advice for that Kendall, Kendra, but I really wanted to like share that that's something that God's been pressing on my heart. Cause I'm a goal go getter. Like I want Emerald yesterday. I went to Ruby. I was like, yeah, whatever. Senior Ruby for a minute. I want Emerald. And God is like, stop, collaborate, listen, <laughs> and let's, <laughs> let's regroup. And so we're getting back into like a really trying to pour back into my team. And then Vicki spent time with me the other day and really helped me see the beauty of the three-way calls. So I just wanted to share that. <laughs> That's so good. No, I absolutely have um, recommendations. So um, the word qualify is what I, I like to use. Um, and it's not just qualify whether they're ambassador or customer. It is a qualification to work the business also. So on that three-way call, you were kind of qualifying are they in your 80% or are they in your 20%? And you don't have to specifically say that, right? Um, you're just trying to figure out, okay, where do you need to get plugged into to be successful? As a leader, you are always looking to figure out what someone's next step is. So I think someone asked me how I close a meeting. The words next step, it's not even an opportunity meeting. It's a call like this. It is, it's always a call to action. You're always trying to figure out what their next step is. And it's something that most leaders fail to do. So if most of you guys go to church, it's the same thing as a minister. They, if you go to a growing church, 
the one thing that makes growing church is different than a church that's not growing is that there is some sort of next step whether it is an altar call or whether it is um, go sign up at the end of church to join a small group. There's always a next step there. It's empowering people to take that next step. So I'm always closing a meeting or closing, you know, a three way call with someone of what is your next best step. Now you have to be unattached to the outcome. It's not on you at that point. It's up to them. Okay. They're the ones who actually have to take the next step, not you. So I'm always just, that's the empowerment part. It's like, I, you are asking them to take this call to action. If it's an ambassador, you know, sign up ambassador, it's, you know, when is a good time for you and I to sit down and sign you up? You know, um, we, we've got the products that you want to like, when is the best time for me to meet with you and get you signed up? So it's always the next step, a call to action. So, um, that's kind of my, I guess, biggest takeaway is like when you are having these three ways is you want to qualify people so that you as a leader, as your team grows, you can't work with every single person. It's just physically impossible. So you're going to have to figure out who are the people that are qualified for you to work with. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm always doing is I'm figuring out who is qualified. It looks different, right? As a gold, it'll start looking different as a Ruby. It really starts looking different as a senior Ruby. And then when you hit diamond, it looks a whole lot different, <laughs> you know? And so as remember, you're working yourself out of a job because as you start to grow, there's going to be more leaders underneath you that are going to be doing the exact same thing. So you're always qualifying people for your time. Um, and I'm saying that in a business sense, not in a uh, ministry sense. I mean, if someone comes to me and they genuinely have an issue or a problem and, and I need to work with them, then I mean, uh, Plexus is a part of my ministry. I'm not going to turn someone away because they need me. But when I'm talking business, I qualify people and how I'm going to actually work with them. Um, really quick. I don't know how long you guys normally go, but I want to, I, I want to, we can keep talking, but I want to make certain I get this in because I, I know y'all's time is precious. Um, one of the things that I feel like, um, our team really has to refocus on because of the attrition. I'm right there with you guys. Our attrition has been off the charts. Um, that is not our fault. That is just, that is an FYI, a back office situation is ha going to happen again. Okay. It may not be the back office. It could be something different. You were in a business, businesses wax and wane. It, unfortunately, I know that's the worst news you've heard, but like I'm transparent. You are, you are in this plexus for life. You are going to have other back office situations, but it's how you handle it. So when you go into another season of storms, you have to pick up the pace. You've got to work harder during that storm to beat attrition. And one thing I feel like my team did not do exponentially well. One leg did, the other ones didn't. I've got one leg that's growing like leaps and bounds. And then I've got other legs that are either going backwards or they're staying the same. Is that you have to push harder during the storm because what we were doing is we all likely went into management mode rather than leaders mode. And I slowed down, you know, my recruiting, I kind of slowed down, you know, my push and my team followed in my footsteps, the majority of them. So we've really been focusing people on going silver. Going silver is how most people get to diamond. If you're constantly getting people to recruit. So all of those people that are stuck halfway to gold, you've got to get them to gold. You've got to get people promoting because the attrition is so bad, especially like for you guys, it's bad. But if you think about it, if you're just a gold ambassador and you barely was holding on to like 20 people and their attrition rate is over 50%, they're down to probably eight or 10 people. You've got to get those people back up to their points and you've got to get people underneath them promoting to silver.
So I'm really trying to focus a lot of my attention on those people that are stuck at like halfway to gold or they were gold and now they're not gold. Um, and getting them back up to their points. They need to go back and start recruiting. They need to rebuild. They need to get, they need to start bringing more people in than they lost. So that's kind of been my team's focus is going silver. Me, me included. I actually have a private group of um, my gold and aboves, and we actually have an accountability group, and I'm really transparent in there. Like, I was doing really good like the beginning of the week of like reaching out to people. And then yesterday I had a really lazy day and was like, I just, I didn't talk to anybody. So I actually posted it in the group and was like, okay, did anybody do better than me today? Because I totally bailed and I did not talk to a single person and I'm really transparent and it gives people permission. And then they start encouraging me and they're like, nope, we got two new signups today. And nope, we talked to two new people. Um, accountability groups, guys, like what you're doing right now is so crucial to your business, but it's also crucial to your downline. Um, and so these accountability groups are, are fabulous. Small groups as your team grow, um, that's been one of the key things I think for me is I will run um, seasons of small groups of bringing people in and kind of pouring into them. Um, that's been really huge for my business. Um, but this is a recruiting business. It's said in Beach Money. My favorite network marketing book is Beach Money. Um, and the one reason I love that book so much is because it's so simple. But he basically says, you are in the business of getting customers, getting ambassadors, and helping your people do the same. Over and over and, and what happens is for a lot of you guys, what I'm hearing you saying is I'm working so hard to become a leader. Okay, that's awesome, but that is secondary to your business. You have to be bringing people into the business. Don't become, because if you put your feet up and all you're doing is working on your personal growth and all you're doing is working on, you know, your, um, your leadership and you fail to be bringing people into the business and, and encouraging your people to do that, Trisha is going to catch up with you especially when you go through something like a back office change. So you've got to constantly be bringing people into the business. So get customers, get ambassadors and help your people do the exact same thing. That's your top priority in network marketing. Hey, I have a question for you and I'm going to have to close the meeting you guys, cause I have a sip and see at noon. So I got to, <laughs> we're doing a lunch and learn and I got to roll. But, um, what would you say is a good goal? We know attrition happens. What would you say would be a good percentage if you looked at your downline? Like if you're adding a hundred, where do you want to be? You know what I'm saying? Is you know what I'm I've saying? always heard, I am not a math geek. Um, uh -huh. Like I, I could not tell you how to work the back office right now. If I, if you had a gun to my head, like I'm just, I don't look at it. I work my business. I have zero green in me. Zero. Like, very, very little. Um, so I, I have heard that 40% is average. Um, so I, I usually, when I work my numbers and stuff, I try to keep my attrition somewhere um, between 30 and 40%. Okay, so. that's what I thought. I just wanted to verify because I just answered that question yeah. with somebody. So that's, um, so yeah, okay, awesome. Well, you guys, I'm going to close the meeting out. This is great. We had 22 people on the call. That's really amazing. I think that's really cool, you guys. Like we started out with like three people, and so now it's this thing that we have going. And I love it. It's you know, it's just such a blessing, isn't it, you guys, to just be in an environment where you've got sidelines and we can just be organic and real and talk. So I'm just grateful for each of you guys. I know for me, it's blessed my business in enormous ways. So thank you, and thank you, Kendra, for your morning, spending your morning with us. And I'm always really excited to be with you because I learned. Yes. Every time was, I hear you. It was so, so great. Would you mind really quick, Dawn, if we prayed out really quick? Yes. I would okay. not mind. I would love it. <laughs> okay. That would be awesome. Uh, my friend Tracy, she's an emerald. She always uh, gives the posture of putting your hands out. So I'm going to ask you guys to put your hands out. He's a good God. He gives amazing gifts. You're not going to offend me if you jump off at this point. I always like to give that too. Um, but I like to, I, I'd love to pray over you guys. Dear Jesus, we thank you so very much. Um, I have cold chills right now. Just over my body, just knowing what amazing work is being done to help people um, with life change, God. And that is exactly what you called us to do is to be life changers. And God, I'm asking you right now that you bless these women, this their business, 
I'm asking you to bless their families. Their families are making sacrifices to be able to, to grow in their finances and to be grow with their team. God, they're all learning that natural gift of leadership that you've given them, God. And I'm asking you right now that you just open up that gift for them and show them exactly what it is that they need to do to grow their business and to grow their team. God, I'm asking you to, to give them the word of uh, being a servant. Um, that is really all you've called us to do is to be a servant of people, God. So just place that word on their heart um, as they go about their journey to Emerald and their journey to Sapphire and their journey to Diamond. God, just make it a blessed um, journey. Um, help them to enjoy the journey, God. And there's going to be stumbling blocks and there's going to be boundaries. And you never told us that this life here on earth was going to be easy, but you did promise us blessed. And God, I'm asking you to bless their business and bless their teams. We give you all the praise and the glory for everything that was said here today. And we love you and we thank you. Amen. Amen. I love you, ladies. Thank you, thank you so much. Today. Thank you, guys. Y'all have a great day. Bye. 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 Bye.